Now, I was born and right there on this farm, and I never, I never did leave. I feel like a native because I've lived here for 60 years, but I came here right out of college working for Buckeye. I was born and raised in Taylor County in the West End on Cabbage Grove. I worked at odd jobs till there wasn't no more jobs and I had to go into service. The only time I was going for during World War II, I was going a while. But when the war, war was over, I stayed, I come back and continue farming. My, my daddy had cows and I started with, with uh, got some from him. And then, then I, later on, I bought his herd. I never did leave home. I stayed. I was raised, I helped my dad in the cows when I was small. And I just, just, just kept raising and stayed in the cow business. And when I first started farming, we had a, a horse or a mule to plow. And the first plow, and I used a little six inch, what they call it, a six inch boy Dixie. Just turned six inches at a time. And it take all day long to turn an acre of land. You got to have, grow grass for the cows and to make hay, and you have to have a lot of equipment, which is we do now. I think we got five or six tractors and two or three hay balers and plows and things that you use to grow the grass for the cows. About 40 acres, about as much as we could you could uh, cultivate with a mule. But when it was a tractor, you cut away hundreds of acres. Well, it was mostly ha hand work, you know. You know it was all hand work. You had a machinery to gather, gather the stuff. You had to gather it by hand. We, we, we truck farmed. We had to gather everything by hand. Picking the peas and butter beans and cutting the okra. And the grains all by hand. You're free to range the land, you know, way back in the early days, you could go where you wanted to. And it's all you always had, it had freedom. I think he is a cattle whisperer <laughs> because he loves the cows and when he goes out, he can move them from one field to the other and with, right by himself and not have a problem. On the open range in 1950, it passes law 1950 to take the cows off from the highways. And then we had to fence them up. But I just, just, just enjoyed it, really. I, I just, just enjoyed all of it every day, you know. They stayed busy and, and contented. And they lived for the Lord. And you stay happy for living for the Lord. I'm Edward C. Sheffield. I'm age 87. I was in the Korean War uh, the whole time the war lasted, plus a few days more. I was with the 24th Division as an artillery outfit. We are stationed in Japan after basic training, they shipped us to Japan, and that's where I was based at whenever the war broke out. Yeah, I was bothered by people calling the Korean War a conflict. It was an all-out dirty war. The Korean War broke out on June the 25th, 1950. My unit was the first one to be called up to enter the Korean War. We learned that we were up against nine North Korean divisions. When the North Koreans overrun us, I was captured on July the 14th, 1950. We transferred from one position to another until we got way up there in North Korea. 
on the border of Manchuria. We seen the first commander of the People's Police Force come into our camp with a guard on each side of him with automatic weapons. He had his handgun in his hand the whole time. He called us together and explained to us that he was the new commander. We called him the Tiger. We nicknamed him the Tiger. He took charge of us, told us that we were going to go on a forced march up through these rugged mountains. They were 100 miles, and the ones that couldn't make the trip, um, the ones that fell behind would be eliminated. And we got on the road and went towards Mompo. We got to the edge of Mompo, and we could see the town. It was burning to the ground. My platoon commander, Lieutenant Thornton, got up and approached the tiger, told him that these men were too sick, too weak to be going on a forced march. The tiger said, you will go or you will die. Lieutenant Thornton called him a madman. The tiger took Lieutenant Thornton he called two of his guards over there, and they took him up a little mountain cliff about 12 feet high there, and uh, they stood him there and tied his hands behind him, put a handkerchief around his head, and the commander walked up there and shot him behind the head, and he rolled off the cliff hit the ground and and then he turned around and said, now we'll go. Well, we were starving to death. We would eat grass, weeds, anything we could get a hold of. Finally, the Korean guard we called the Tiger told us we were gonna be going back down the river and be turned over to the Chinese. When we got down there and was turned over to the Chinese, this was a welcome thing because the Chinese treated us better, gave us more to eat, gave us a better place to lay down at night and sleep. You have to try to forget about everything back home when you're in a condition like that. They hauled us down to the neutral zone and backed up there and unloaded us uh, at the repatriation area. And uh, it was a big tent, and there were uh, military officers all around. They asked us if we wanted anything. Yeah, we want something to eat and some, some clean clothes to put on. And we want to go home. American generals stood up there in front of us and told us, you're home now. We won't ever have to go back to that place. A lot of times I wished that I were home instead of in Korea. I've made many friends during the war. Uh, a lot of whom I'm still in contact with. I guess my most memorable moment in Korea was, was when I was wounded. And I was helping to evacuate uh, wounded from the battlefield. And I got a piece of shrapnel in my chest. That episode of me being wounded and transported and regaining uh, health and coming back to my uh, original unit was, I guess, the most memorable thing I had over there. The best moments were when we went to R&R. &R. Uh, the best moments in, in Korea were in reserve. 
and they had a rest camp. And it was not just Americans, but it was uh, Turkish, uh, English, uh, Australians, all sorts, all manners of nationality. And you got to, uh, you got to meet those nationalities and, and be with them. And I guess that was the best memories that I had at the time. My grandfather came to Taylor County from Georgia. His grandfather came to the States from the island of Erin in Scotland. My daddy was not a minister, but he was a lay leader and a very good lay leader. He was the father of 13 children. I'm the youngest of the 13. And according to the count, I'm my grandfather's 100th grandchild. And I'm the only living grandchild as of now. I was born during the Depression. So we did not have a lot of, we were not, we were not wealthy. Most people back in the 30s were not wealthy, but we survived. The changes have been for the better. The main thing, we do have electricity. We didn't have electricity at our house until I graduated from high school. We didn't, we didn't even have a radio. Some of our neighbors had radios and we could go to their house on Saturday afternoon and listen to the Grand Ole Opry. And later, when movies came out, they would come to Shady Grove on Saturday afternoons late and show a movie. And they used the um, side of my uncle's store as a screen. The B.C. Blannon store was the largest store in Shady Grove. It was a general store, and I have been told he also had coffins upstairs in the, in the upstairs part. I never went upstairs to see, but I was told that they also had coffins, so he had a little bit of everything to sell. Our main entertainment was going to church. My daddy believed in attending church every chance we got. We lived one mile from the church, but we walked to church. We thought it was good life. That's what we were exposed to, and we thought it was good life. We were happy. The uh, first church of uh, Perry started in 1870 officially. But uh, really, uh, 18, December of 1869, there was a young pastor, Robert Barnett, and uh, he had what they called the Taylor Lafayette uh, Mission. He had 19 places that he preached at. Robert Barnett was appointed in uh, 1869, late 1869. He was 20 years old, he was a pastor, and he had, uh, it was uh, 17 preaching locations, 95 mile circuit that he had to go around and preaching at all these churches. The first year he rode almost 4,000 miles, 4,000 miles horseback. It was out of that uh, preaching circuit that, he, that this church was eventually started. So we claim 1870 as our, as our official birthday. The church was not originally at this location. It was one block to the uh, east of where we're currently at. Uh, we currently we call that uh, Heritage House. The church has been here a long time, has a great history, just regular folks. And if you know Perry, uh, it was a cattle town. It was a cow town and had the famous Florida cattle, uh, Florida uh, cracker uh, cows. And, uh, and I can just imagine some of the stories that people heard uh, as they were actually, actually rolling those cows through town, right, right in the footsteps of, the, of this very church. They've been faithfully preaching the gospel here since, uh, 
since 1870, and that's quite a legacy, and Lord willing, we'll continue preaching the gospel right here. I'm more of a loner. I've always been a loner. I'm an only child. I enlisted 1940, right out of high school. Well, I didn't have a job, and uh, I really didn't want to go to college. Uh, it was the best decision I ever made because I learned a craft. I learned how to do drawing. I learned how to type. I, I was assigned to work for a master sergeant in nine months in the Army, which is unheard of, really. I was a, a, a regular sergeant, a buck sergeant. Later, I went in and did the, uh, became a draftsman of maps from aerial photographs. And that was in, in Fort Belvoir. In August of 1942, they sent our organization, they changed the name of the organization from the 30th Engineers to the 60th Engineers, Topographic Battalion, and sent us over to England. We were stationed in Kew Gardens, around Kew Gardens in London. I had some, several friends, but I didn't make any close friends. Never made close friends. I had friends uh, that we buddied around with, did different things, but as far as being that close, never. I was more, more interested in girls. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I say, I say, I had I stayed over in England much longer. I was, I was uh, dating a girl by the name of Myra, and had I stayed there, I think we would have gotten married. I, I guess the, the job that I held with Watkins, um, I came there as a uh, planner to help plan little jobs that they had, and my, I ended up being the uh, uh, one who would write the... Uh, Whenever Proctor Gamble was going to do a project, I ended up uh, as the estimator for the uh, how much the project was going to cost. I, I, I liked the job, and that was then that was nothing but but description of what they wanted to do and things of that nature, and I enjoyed it. One of the things that I would remind the young people of is the sacrifices that were made by the older generation so that they could be free. I was members in Peperi. I remember when there was, and most of us were dirt streets, and you go to Peperi and, you, and you see cows and hogs running around on the streets in Peperi. The biggest event that we've attended in Perry is the Pine Tree Festival. And uh, it, it's a, an event that uh, is supported by the whole county. Uh, there was 50,000 people there. I've always gone back home. And it's just a very special place for me. And I have a lot of respect for the the church, and I, in fact, I still attend the church that I grew up in. I enjoyed, I enjoyed work, working here. I've always enjoyed, I left Taylor County twice and I came back. I left once in 1974 and came back in 1977. Uh, I like it here. You're free to range the land, you know, way back in the early days, you could go where you wanted to. And it's all you always had, you had freedom. And you could, you could make a living if you work. You know, just, just a good place to live. <laughs>